Hi, um, I'm Jonas, nice to meet you. I'll be doing this very pretentious presentation now. <laughs> um, it sounds very pretentious, and it is, but um, it's really just about a couple of concepts of how we approach narrative in games, because it is fundamentally different from writing for any other medium. Um, so I'll just keep it fairly simple, but just I want to inject these ideas into people's heads, basically, because I think that they're useful, and they're sometimes missing when uh, people approach designing narrative for games, all right? So this is a very brief introduction to me. I've been making games for a very long time because I started very young. Um, that uh, Yeah, quite a long time ago. I've made a lot of games that have some sort of sea theme. Um, why? Don't know, probably because I'm Greek. Um, I have written all of these games except one of them, which is not an actual game. Um, can you guess which one of those? Yes, it's Phoenix Point. Um, no, it is How I Met Your Grandmother, although I have met all of your grandmothers, um, and they, they really like me. Grandmothers really like me for some reason. Um, yeah, so I've been making games for quite a long time. I started when I was really just a kid in Greece in the early 2000s. My first game was very hard to upload to the internet because it was three megabytes, and it was very hard to find web space for three megabytes. Um, a video game. And they've all been narrative games, almost all of them. Uh, I actually like playing games that are not that narrative heavy all the time, but I seem to be making them all the time. And I invented Air. That's important. Just want to take credit for that because nobody ever gives me credit. Um, it's a real shame because it's very important for breathing. Uh, Talos Principle 2 is what I'm currently working on. It's going to be really nice when it comes out. I am going to be talking a bit about Talos Principle in general in this presentation. You don't need to have played it to understand the presentation. It's just to give you an example for how narrative works in games and how maybe narrative works in a game that's also trying to be a little bit ambitious in what it's trying to accomplish. To me, I, I don't mind games that are just fun, right? I've written stuff that's just silly and, and, and all that. But I also think games are very interesting as a medium that's maybe artistic and more serious. Although serious is to me not a contradiction of silly. So you, you can you know you can have fun in a game and still be serious. It doesn't have to be, uh, oh, it's a game about a sad grandmother or whatever, you know, indie games have a tendency to sometimes produce. You probably know what I mean by that. Um, so I do think that games can be fun and meaningful at the same time. Now, spatiality, what the fuck does this mean? Um, <laughs> it's a very confusing word, but it, it derives from interactivity, right? So when we talk about interactivity, we tend to think of it in terms of choice. Oh, player can do A or B. The worst version of that is, do you want to drown the puppies or save the puppies? Which is really the most boring thing that games have a tendency to do. Then you have more complicated versions of drown the puppies, but somehow this will be good. And if you save them, it'll be really bad and you'll feel guilty because you saved the puppies. Um, but... In general, and, and then there's obviously the more advanced, more interesting version of that, which is um, you know actually making choices that affect the narrative and, and have different outcomes, and, and maybe even you see a different part of the game. But to me, uh, there's there's a different consequence of interactivity that's very fundamental to how games work that we don't think about, and that is that um, narrative in games exists in space. It exists in a three-dimensional space, and that's actually very key, because that doesn't exist in any other art form. So an example, a, a, a very simple example there, is just um, Skyrim, right? You go to Skyrim, walking around, blah, 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 talking guys. Well, you can go around a corner and find a bookshelf, and there's books in it, and you can read it. You can read those books, and they contain narrative content. Now, that might not always be interesting, but what's very unique about this is that no other art form really has this, right? And a movie is just a narrative that continues going forward. A book, again, it just goes forward, and you know, unless it's a very experimental book, but even then you're probably gonna read it in that particular way. But in a game, narrative exists in a three-dimensional space, and this can have a lot of consequences. It means characters are walking around, are in different places. Uh, you know, th the classic example, you're reading something on a wall, which you know everyone says over was overused, and then with the pandemic, people started scrawling things on the walls that were exactly that. 
Um, so we all live in a video game. Um, so anyway, this may seem simple, and yet I think it's a really key insight when you're constructing a game, when you're actually doing the work of writing the narrative for a video game, it's very important to start thinking of how the narrative overlays the three-dimensional space in which you are writing. So you're not writing just a story where A happens and B happens, but you really have to think about it in terms of the, the, the three-dimensional space in which it exists and how it interacts with that space um, and what the player experience is going to be as they move through that space and experience your narrative there. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Talos Principle. Uh, Talos Principle is a puzzle game with a narrative that it has several layers. It's designed to be almost like a kind of archaeological experience. So there is a top layer that you're always going to get. So there's a top layer that every player will always experience. And then there are some layers that are more easily accessible. Uh, and then there are layers that are deeper and deeper and deeper. And to fully understand the story of the game, you have to dig into the game. Um, so again, that is a very physical kind of way of, of organizing a narrative inside a video game. And it obviously also connects to the themes of the game, which have a lot to do with sort of digging through the past, and it has a lot of actual archaeological references in it. Um, so here we have, uh, this is just a rough kind of example. Uh, or a rough kind of uh, structure of the game world. So you basically start in what's the Roman kind of part of the world and you solve puzzles, you go out into sort of a hub, you get access to other places, and eventually there's this tower that you have to ascend. Um, but there are different types of narrative that exist inside of this world. So we have what's this, where, where it says Elohim there, that's a, a, the voice of an almost kind of narrator. It's the voice of God in the game. It's this figure who challenges you, says you have to solve these puzzles, but you must never ascend the tower. So that moves with you through the game. Wherever you are, you can hear him speak, unless you're in some very specific points in the game. So that's very easy to understand how that follows you. Um, but at the same time, inside of that world, you have uh, these voiceovers that you can find. The voiceovers provide yet another perspective on the events of the game uh, from a scientist who is speaking about, um, you know, how the backstory of the game happens, but also expressing certain very humanistic philosophical concepts. Um, you also have these QR messages, which are basically messages on walls that you can read from various characters that exist in the sort of mythology of the game. And you also have Milton, who is a AI that only exists inside certain terminals that you find as you move around the game. And you can talk to him and debate with him. And then you also have, on top of that, terminals on which there are texts that you can read from basically various philosophers, internet threads, all kinds of no messages that people have sent back e to each other. It's a, it's a, it's a wide collection of texts from humanity before whatever happened that has put you into the situation that you are in the game. I'm not going to you know, spoil the details of the game now. But the important thing is that, as you can hear from this, there are different categories of narrative that each function in a different way. Some are set inside the world you're also in. Some are from before. Some are you know, a, a specific character kind of going through a story that you're following in individual bits. And then there's two characters who coexist in the world with you in different ways. So when you're writing a game, you have to track all of that. You have to think about the functions of each of these types of narrative and what they are doing for the player. So each of them is giving them morsels of information, and they, in their heads, are trying to put it all together and understand what's actually happening in this game. What is this game about? And of course, to make it interesting, you have to make sure that you're feeding the player the right morsels at the right time, um, which is difficult because the game is open. Uh, making Talos 2 is even more challenging for us in many ways because it is, an, it is more open or more uh, you know, multi-threaded in some ways, and that is an, another challenge. So um, we're experiencing that very much right now. So that, that's the thing about video games that I kind of want people to think about. 
Because we think about this very simple aspect of it's just choice, right? Oh, the player can do this, or the player can do that. But really what's happening is the player is moving through this enormous web of individual bits of narrative that all should tie together in some way. So you want, uh, so you want there to be interesting ways in which these things are connected, but you also need to be thinking constantly, what are the various ways in which the player might experience this? What if he reads this first? What if he reads that first? And more importantly, what if he doesn't read any of it? What if the player starts out saying, eh, it's a game, games don't have good narratives, I don't give a shit. And then they play for a while and they think, this voiceover stuff is really well written and it's kind of interesting. I wonder what's going on with the setting. Maybe I should try digging a bit into it. Okay, have we made it possible for the player to go back and read those things? Um, you know, this, have we accidentally, ha do we have some cutoff point where you can't read the previous things anymore? So thinking about it in this kind of three-dimensional way and thinking of it as this, this web of interactive, uh, of small points of narrative that interact with each other in various ways, is, I think, um, pretty crucial. Okay. This is a photo of a cat. Uh, he's called Damian, after the composer of the Talos Principle, although we call him Dum Dum because he's dumb. Um, all right, dialectics, very pretentious again, but um, I'm gonna keep this, again, very, very simple, right? We're not gonna get into the complexities of philosophy here, but um, it's a, it's a fairly basic concept to keep in mind here, which is the idea of how things interact with each other and produce a third thing, as it says, uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So um, in terms of games, this is about how all those nodes that I mentioned before in the spider web, how they interact with each other, and how you can deliberately design something that uses the interactions between these different points. Because that's also something that games are uniquely good at. They can present different ideas without necessarily making it about you just choosing one idea over the other. Because they can present things in parallel. Again, uh, a book and uh, you know, a movie, all these things are kind of linear. But the non-linearity of games means that things kind of can coexist in parallel inside their world. So for example, in Phoenix Point, we have three different factions. And there, a lot of effort went into trying to give each of the factions kind of an interesting perspective that may be flawed, and it's not perfect. Um, this is also a principle that's at work in the Talos Principle. So I'm gonna go back to that for a second. Um, in the Talos Principle, you have different figures, right? So you have, um, this godlike figure, Elohim. And Elohim has a very specific way that he wants things to be done. You will solve the puzzles. You will not go up the tower. This is what's good in life. This is what meaning is. And then you have Milton, who is um, kind of a rogue AI. And he is an utter cynic, right? He constantly asks you all these questions in these interactive dialogues. And he's always... Hello? Okay. He's always trying to break down... Um, your beliefs. And the thing is, you could go for the mistake here of just saying these are two choices, right? This is the one way and this is the other way, and they both suck. But the interesting thing, I think, that, that what games kind of allow you to do is that we present two different figures who are both wrong in their own way. Or you can agree with them if you want to. There are ways of doing that in the game. But really, they have severe flaws in their thinking, both of them. And ultimately, you have the ability to kind of pick a path that is neither of them or that has elements of both of uh, their beliefs. And the game, in fact, is deliberately structured so that it presents you with different ideas and allows those ideas to interact dialectically in your head. So that's something that we really sought to do. We're really trying very hard to do that in Talos Principle 2 as well, to really keep that in mind. We're not just presenting you with an idea, but we're frequently presenting you with the opposite of that idea as well. Or then sometimes with three or four different perspectives on one thing. Because, like I said, um, all these things kind of coexist at the same time. And what you have to think about is how do they interact 
with each other. Going through this world, and I have this voice telling me one thing, and then I have these computer terminals telling me another thing, and then I find all these texts, and they can give me yet another perspective. And so when you are designing a game, when you're thinking about game narrative, really the interesting thing is not just all these nodes that exist in the spider web, but then the connections between these nodes. And it's up to you as the writer, it's up to you as the writer to deliberately create those connections, to foster those connections by creating uh, parallels in the writing, by deliberately having things react to each other, right? You, you can do that, it's interactive. So you can actually also have, in another example, say a character react to something you said to another character or something you read. Or, so there's many, many ways. Some of them are just really already baked into just the way that you write it. And then others are, like I said, interactive. Of, uh, these are ways of causing the individual nodes to interact with each other in the player's mind. Because there's another dialectical relationship really there, and that's the relationship between the player and the game itself. Because uh, any form of art really just happens between the player, between the reader, and the work of art. So that's another thing that you have to keep in mind when you're creating something, is that you're not just creating something static, but there is a person uh, there's a person there that's going to be playing it, and as they play it, there is an, ex an experience that's unique to them and is only happening you know, for them. And you're kind of providing the, the primordial soup out of which this experience is going to happen, but you don't have full control over how it's going to happen. But you do have control over what goes in the soup. Um, yeah, that's actually pretty much the basics of what I'm trying to, to explain, but... I think it, it, it matters quite a lot because we do kind of get, you know, our brains poisoned by other media. Like, obviously, there's fantastic work in, in all kinds of media, but when you approach a game, you really are working in a very unique kind of medium that doesn't, and it's not just I can choose this or I can interact, but it really it's structured at a fundamental level in a different way than anything else. So when I'm writing a game, I'm not trying to do the same thing I'm doing when I'm writing a book or when I'm writing uh, you know, uh, a screenplay or something where one thing follows the other. I'm writing lots of little bits. And the important thing is not just that the bits have to be good, and they really do. That's very important. That's another thing that people forget, right? Um, that it, they have to be aesthetically good. Because if they're not, if they're badly written, then all the structure shit doesn't matter. They have to be good. But then the art of it is how are they arranged? And you can spend so much time thinking about this. Like when we're making Talos 2 right now, you know how often we debate, okay, but what goes on this thing that the player finds in the first hour of the game? Do we put in this text or that text? And it's a secondary text. You know what? 50% of players will never read it. But you know the other 50% or the 10% who are really into it, what is their experience going to be? Which ideas do we want to implant at which point, and how, how are they going to interact with the ideas later? If, if you have someone making an argument about what the world, what's good in the world, like Talos II has a lot about technology, right? What, you know, and civilization. You, you have a certain idea now, you have its opposite later. You have a yet another take and another point in the game. You have to think, how is the player going to encounter these, and how are they going to interact with each other in the player's mind? Might be going a little bit fast here, but hopefully we'll have some questions or something, or I'll just give you random trivia um, about things breaking down horrible ways. Um, okay. Um, that's actually the end. Um, so yeah, I've kept it very, very short. But please ask me about game writing. Um, and I'll go deeper into this if, if anyone wants to know about a specific part of it or what it means when you're making a game. Anyone? Uh, so, I have actually a very per peculiar question. Um, since you're writing narrative games, uh, have you heard of Disco Elysium? Yes. Okay, so this will make <laughs> the question a lot easier. Uh, when how would, what would you say about Disco, Disco Elysium's uh, attempt at uh, 
narrative storytelling and presentation because it's one of the few games at least i've played in recent times that uh, allow you to choose any path mm -hmm. and in turn the consequence for your actions aren't they're, they're portrayed in a positive light regardless because the story is about failure right and um uh, i wanted to ask how do you uh feel about the whole way the writers and the designers of that game handled its narrative. I haven't finished playing Disco Elysium because it makes me sad. <laughs> and it just makes me sad because it's like, Jesus, I wish we all got to do that all the time. Um, no, I find it very impressive. I find it very impressive the sheer <laughs> amount of effort and freedom that they had. That's something that I haven't talked about here, but of course the reality is that frequently you're working for companies and you don't necessarily have the freedom to do anything you want with narrative. Like we're very lucky with Talos Principle that we got to do what we got to do. Uh, I, I have the feeling that a lot of what makes Disco Elysium special is just that you got a bunch of people who are not very different from me in some ways philosophically and you just gave them completely free reign. Um, so... I, I do find it very impressive what they've done, which is to just kind of almost be very liberated in approaching the material and go to some places that are fairly, could be fairly controversial. It's actually, I'm kind of surprised, honestly, that the response was so positive because I could imagine some journalist doing kind of a fascist playthrough and going, this game is fascist. Um, so um, as to the idea that you know the game reacts to anything that you do as positive in a way, I think that's a legitimate choice. It's not the only way of doing something. You can have a game, I think, that has a certain... And I think Disco Elysium also, it does have a certain perspective that some journalists, I feel, sometimes fail to see as well. It does come from a particular worldview in general, how it presents its world and, and, and how it thinks that the world works. Uh, but I think that depends. It, it's something actually that we, when making Talos 2, have sometimes struggled with a little bit in that the writers have certain beliefs and of course those structure what you're going to do, right? Um, because it's just how you think the world works. And at the same time, you want to leave space because I talked so much about you know, giving different perspectives. You want to leave some space for those perspectives to be genuine, to be treated as legitimate. Uh, because otherwise, it's like, yeah, um, here's five political choices or philosophical choices. All of them except the one I like are, are wrong. That's not such an interesting experience. You know, you, you want to have that perspective that's yours, that structures the thing, especially if you're working with a certain amount of freedom uh, to be allowed to do so. Uh, because if you're working for a lot of bigger companies, you're not, you're not going to get that freedom. Um, but you, you also want to leave some space for the game to react to what the player is doing and for it to feel legitimate in a sense. Because what I've noticed in a lot of games that what I hate is when at the very end the game goes like, no, everything you did is wrong. You're bad. Feel bad. And it just kind of takes away the entire meaning of the entire experience for me. And that's something we try very hard to avoid doing, even though that way there's no big twist at the, at the end. And some people tend to identify a big twist at the end with good writing. But, um, or a good ending. But to me, it's more about playing out the consequences of what you've done and having it feel like a meaningful overall experience. So to me, if you pick an ending that I don't love for Talos 2, for example, it's still an ending that hopefully will feel poetic and meaningful. Uh, I have a question, which is in, in the regards of the writing process. Uh, in your own words, because I understand that you write for different media, uh, how would you compare uh, writing for a screenplay uh, and then in, into, into a game? Because the thing that I'm most curious about is do you uh, land an idea, it's whatever an idea is, in the uh, three-act structure, which is you know commonly used in the filmmaking world? Could you elaborate on that, please? Yes. Yeah. So... Um... The difference in between working in those two, I mean, not that I have a, a published screenplay or movie currently out. I do have a very nice audio drama called Gospels of the Flood. You should listen to that. Um, but um, so th having written things, though, in screenplay format, uh, it is very different. 
Because like I said, it's structurally different on at the very basis of what you're doing, unless you're writing a game that happens to be incredibly linear, which is kind of rare, it does exist. So even Serious Sam 4, for example, has side missions, it has uh, lines that can be set during combat, it has all this material, right, which exists in parallel. It doesn't exist in a linear structure. So it's like there's 100 lines that can be set during combat, there's 200 lines that can be set during combat. So again, when you're writing a screenplay, you're really going beginning, middle, end. You know, if it's a three-act structure or five-act structure, um, in a game, it's more like, I mean, you might have, here's the intro, but then even already the first area, first level, first thing can sometimes play out in 500 different ways. And, or you're just creating kind of a cloud of options. So you might have uh, NPC characters who can say lots of lines depending on what happening, what's happening in the game. So immediately you're going and say this, you can say and this, and immediately it just becomes this wide thing um, so, of course, you're trying to hit certain points, right? You are trying to kind of create an arc through the game. But you're doing it in a much more fuzzy way. You don't have that nice thing of, you know, first, the first scene, the second scene, and then that leads to the third scene. Uh, very frequently, you don't have that choice in a video game. And the other thing is video games are incredibly long. Like, it's, you're writing a season of a TV show more, more than you're writing uh, a movie. And yet, frequently, you're trying to make it feel like a movie. So, um, in the sense of it's, a, it's one story rather than more something more episodic. But uh, at the end of the day, it always becomes much more fuzzy than writing a straight-up screenplay. And you have to keep that in mind. Because when you see games that are written in the other way, they frequently don't work very well because they're just going against the grain of what the medium is like, which is that it's incredibly flexible and, and things can happen in, in different orders. Um, but again, there are exceptions, but, but in general, I would say it's always, it's a wider structure that you have to keep in mind. And that's why also we don't work in final draft, but like in a spreadsheet most of the time. I mean, if you put it in a nutshell, it's, uh, you have a, a protagonist that has a problem and this problem has to be solved in, you know, there are a lot of obstacles that that character has to overcome and at the end there's a resolution, which is either uh, he wins or lose. So it's kind of the same, but as you as you probably mentioned, you know, in a wider spectrum, something like a TV series, for example, a really long one, yeah. Yes, I mean, although, <laughs> you know, in some ways, then you're playing a game that's a strategy game and you don't have a protagonist as such. And you have, it's maybe more like an ensemble cast or, or you don't even have characters with clearly distinct personalities. So now you're trying to, to instill a personality into, say, the faction that you're playing. You just, the, the group that, like, you know, so that the player still feels, okay, we all set out together to accomplish this thing and in the end we succeeded. Um, but it is very different because a movie or something is usually really built around people and not all video games are built around individual human beings. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, and I've been wondering about this for a very long time, uh, in various ways, I guess. Uh, does the necessary fragmentation of writing for video games inherently weaken the potential for a strong and driving narrative of the type that books and movies are obviously very capable of? And how do video games really make up for that structural impossibility? Because is it just the interactivity of the medium that makes up for that lack of strength and drive and structure or should there be something more i i don't think it necessarily weakens it i think that done right you can have all of these if you connect all of these points in the in the spider web that i was talking about if you connect them then they're all pulling together hmm. and every little bit reinforces every other little bit the difficulty is doing that huh. the difficulty is both simply inherent to the medium so it's just really hard to write that and then there's just all the other stuff that comes in the way, like, well, the marketing department said we should change this and this and this and this 20 minutes before the game is released. Okay. Um, you have no idea how many bizarre choices you have seen in video games or you're like, wow, the developers must be really stupid. It's not the developers. Um, they didn't want it to be like that at all. Um, so it's publishers, you know, whatever, interfering with it a lot of the time that actually caused some of the bizarre problems. But... You're right, it is a challenge of the medium. 
to do that. And sometimes the gameplay, you don't want to constantly interrupt the gameplay with narrative, right? You just, you want it to feel cohesive. But sometimes there's just something fun in the game and the player goes off and does that for three hours and it can break the immersion. But then the point is to try and as much as you can make it be a holistic experience. This is, this is also hard inside a company, right? It's hard because the writers are frequently isolated um, from the rest of the company. And, and because of that, people are doing stuff that doesn't fit what they're writing. And the best games are the ones where everyone is really getting together a lot and talking together. And so when the level designers are doing something, they're like, they're thinking about what the writers wrote and the writers have seen what the game looks like and they know what things are and then they're trying to respond to that. And the more you, and that's again, a kind of a dialectical relationship. Like I said, everything kind of comes from the connections between lots of individual points. And that's also true inside the company. So the more all of that pulls together, the more you feel, oh yeah, this is a world. This is just a world that I'm living in and all of these things make sense with that world. And then even, you know, the, the objects in the world or a little description here, all of it can make you feel that you're in that world. And if that stuff doesn't match, then you're immediately thrown out. That's a big problem in games in general. Somebody puts in a dumb joke somewhere as an Easter egg and suddenly the entire game is ruined for someone because they hit up on it in the wrong moment and it just broke their immersion. Big problem in Tal's principle, in Easter eggs. Um, but uh, in general, there's, because it's so fragmented, there's a million ways it can go wrong more than, uh, than a, a book can. Because also usually somebody's not going to put something completely insane somewhere <laughs> into a book um, in the same way that they will in a video game. Also, I do have to ask, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of Chinese people in a factory and th they're writing them down and sending them to me and getting paid very little money. Uh, the strength of Fiverr <laughs> these days. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So uh, I suppose my question is going to be about those Chinese people. Uh, in the Talos Principle, the first one, uh, you've managed to create a very nice combination of many different stories into a variation on the biblical narrative uh, about the, the creation of Adam and uh, his eventual transcendence, let's say, into a new Adam. Uh, so the question is, well, maybe there are two questions in there. Uh, the first is, how did you approach all these different narratives into creating them, uh, into meshing them together? And the second one is, how much will that biblical narrative influence the Talos Principle too? Okay, so in terms of approaching it, it's... <sighs> It's really just coming at it with an awareness of how that you're going to be doing it in this way where it's incredibly fragmented. Um, and always looking for the parallels between what you're writing and how it's structured. So the story itself, right, is about this kind of syncretic way in which religions develop and, and philosophy develops and ideas develop. The game itself is like it. Elohim is... is is, is, is he actually syncretizes things into narratives. That's his function, his original function. And he himself, however, everything that he believes, he has constructed out of fragments. So coming at it with the awareness that it's going to be like that, um, I think is kind of the important part, right? So, so from the beginning, we're like, we, we have these kind of strands and how are we going to create individual parts of, of the narrative that are going to reflect that. So we're going to, we're going to create an a Greek philosopher. We invented a Greek philosopher for our purposes. That would, you know, be one strand. And we invented uh, um, a, a saint who, who, you know, has written certain things. And, and we, so we, you invent the things that you need and you, you draw on real text as well. Obviously, we always had a mix of fiction and nonfiction. Um, but, but I think it all it all depends on coming at it structurally and already thinking about it in those terms. I think that's the only way I can really, beyond that it's just obviously inspiration and writing, but I think the key thing is, is to already think of some, that you're creating kind of a mosaic or, or an interwoven kind of thing um, from the get-go um, in order to accomplish that. And as for the biblical themes, yeah, they continue. Uh, the, the whole syncretic element of, you know, Greek uh, mythology and, and myth and all of that does continue. Uh, maybe it's heavier on the mythology than on the biblical things, but it's still there um, in, in the next one as well. Uh, 
What kind of different uh, processes do you have for different types of games when writing them? For example, uh, do you have a difference writing an RTS and an RPG? They can be both fantasy games, but as you said before, they're not uh, personal. Like RTSs are not all the time personal, like the RPG. Uh, what kind of differences do you have in writing them? So. I'm going to go back to the same thing again. It's starting by thinking about structure. So it's, th it's starting about thinking, what is the structure of the gameplay? How does this game work? Where in how this game works can I hook the narrative in? Like, how does it connect to the narrative structure? Because if you come at it always the same way, then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm going to have a protagonist for this RTS. And there's like, how, well, how does that tie in, into anything? I'm commanding an army. Why is there this one dude? Okay, is he a commander? Is he a thing? So you, you have to start by looking at what is the gameplay structure of what you're doing? Where does the narrative fit in? Not forcing it in, just where does it naturally fit into the structure? And from there, develop elements and that can, that can mean very different things. It can mean trying to personalize it, um, or it can mean trying to, be, to give it a history. So in, in Phoenix Point, we tried to create a lot of backstory, a lot of history to all of these events. We also didn't have the means, I think, to have endless cutscenes. So um, that's also budget is obviously also another factor. Um, but, but, but there we try to be more kind of... Yeah, more world building kind of, and create meaning through through assigning ideologies and ideas and histories, and then allowing you to find that. But um, yeah, the the important thing is that I think you should start when, especially when you're assigned to a game and you're not kind of making it from from scratch, is that you look at what does this give me? What are my right? What are my opportunities inside of this to to create a narrative rather than trying to impose a narrative. Uh, which can lead to very artificial results. But usually there are things already inside the game that kind of have a narrative function. And that can be things characters say, descriptions uh, in menus, uh, items. I mean, you know, Dark Souls is the classic example of a game that's largely told through item descriptions, you know, where there's this vast lore that, that people love to engage with. So you, you find your opportunities. And it has to be different every time you make a game. Like to me, that's essential. I don't think that there is a formula for writing games. I think every single game you must look at how it's structured and then try and find something that works with that. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for this uh, insightful to talk about your uh, way of writing for video games. I have such a question. Do you have experience in writing for live immersive experiences, for example, LARPing, live action role playing? <laughs> and if yes, can you tell what is the difference? Um, I, I mean, just did that for the first time. Um, it is a thing called the locksmith's dream um, that I helped with. I didn't write it in the, the total thing, but I was uh, involved with its design and I wrote parts of it. Um, that's an event that takes place over one day at a beautiful old house in, in England. It's very expensive. You can still go, there's a few, few tickets left. <laughs> um, it costs a lot though, sadly. Um, um, that one is more unpredictable. So I was working with a designer of the whole thing and producer, and I kept trying, I, I kept, because he has a million ideas, and what I kept saying is, is it feasible? Is it, is it actually, is, that, is anyone actually capable of understanding it? So it's like, he, <laughs> I love the man, but he had some very, you know, crazy ideas, like, well, there will be certain smells in certain rooms, and they'll signify something, and I'm like, Who's going to understand that? There's no time. You're running around. You're eating food. You're doing things. You're not going to tell the smell of something. Um, it, you can have the smell, and it works into the reality of the whole thing. It's very hard to make something dependent on that. Um, so my work, actually, on that game was mostly always trying to say, um, how is it actually going to work when you have 20 people running around? So, So it was kind of identifying core things that we knew we could expose people to. Um, and, and then a lot of it is, is up in the air, to be honest. You, you have to create interesting opportunities for things to happen, but um, unless it's somehow very heavily controlled, but usually these things aren't, um, then it's more about creating a space in which things can happen. And so we create a kind of scavenger hunts through it, you know, things that we knew 
there was a skeleton that you could follow to achieve certain things that were interconnected in such a way that they couldn't break. Because again, you've got 20 people running around, they can break things in a lot of ways. Um, so you create a skeleton, and then you create a lot of content that they can find and can use. But then some of the most interesting stuff that happens, you have no control over because it's between players. Um, that's scary. That also means it can fail in ways that you just can't control. Like somebody's having a bad day, he's a dick to the other players, and the whole mood of the thing just goes to hell. Um, but, but it is also very, again, like I said, spatial. So in this particular case, it was inside a house. So a lot of it was looking at photos of the house and thinking, what are the locations? And then deriving story elements from those. So we had an interesting kind of hidden space. So we were like, okay, wow. Well, how do we lead people to the hidden space, but also how do we make it meaningful, right? So came up with this, you know, magical story of a man who drank some magical thing and fell asleep there for years and years and, and only came out decades later. And that, that came from the necessity of using the space in an interesting way and, and uh, imprinting meaning on the space. That's also something you, as a game writer you do a lot. Like say you have an open world game and there's like 15 abandoned colonies and you're like, okay, how do I make these have meaning? So, so um, again, you, you're looking at the three-dimensional space and you're trying to, to impose story on it in that case. But you go like, oh, this one is next to a river and everyone's dead. Monsters came out of the river. You know, and in, in, in various such ways, you try to, to, to draw on the, the environment of the game and then create interconnections. And if you're lucky, you get some you know, level designer or artist to also do a couple of things that then you know, reinforce that, because otherwise it's very one-sided. Is this thing working? OK. Uh, so on the subject of the fragmented pieces of narrative uh, in multiple places, Let's say that in act one of your game, uh, your character has uh, spotted a book about dragons, but never uh, bothered to pick it up. Now in act five, he uh, encounters dragons and they became uh, very interesting to him. And he wants to go back and read that book. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how, uh, on some game mechanics where uh, this process would be the least painful, revisiting uh, places that uh, you have been to and missed the narrative? Yeah, that's that's tricky. Um, it, <laughs> there are multiple ways of approaching it. So, for example, um, somebody gives you that book if you haven't picked it up. Like, you can always have a character. You can just check: did the character pick up that book, or, or did the character read that book? And then you can have a line where someone says, "By the way, did you know that you know, uh, old man Fartface's book on dragons is very informative?" And you know. Something like that. You can have the book in multiple locations. Um, sometimes if it's very crucial, you can obviously make it so that you force the, it on the player at some point. Like into, But a player who doesn't care doesn't care. That's a very big problem. Um, so in your case, if the, and we've encountered that precise problem, if the player starts caring later, either you somehow make them have the text already on them, you make it available to them, um, you, you point it out via another character, um, or depending on the specifics of the game, of course, there might be various, various tricks. And often you can do more than one thing, right? Mo often you can have multiple. You, you have, if you have a game with dialogues, you can actually just pop up a dialogue option with some character that's only enabled at this point and where the character goes, oh, you want to know more about, you know, Old Man Poopy's dragon book. I have a copy or whatever. But, and that can be awkward, right? And sometimes you, you create these slightly awkward solutions for players who decided, you know, 90% of the game through that now they're interested in the story. Um, I don't know if there's a perfect solution. I mean, ideally, frankly, the player can go back and still find that book. But if it's the kind of narrative that really moves forward and you're not, you don't have access to that location anymore, <sighs> I mean, what if the player has picked it up but hasn't read it? What if the player picked it up, opened it, so the variable is set that says the player read it, but the player didn't read it because they closed it after a second? So <laughs> you come up with these horror scenarios, and believe me, like writing Talos 2, I, we have a, a long list of bizarre things players can do, and there's always going to be somebody who does it. Um, 
There is a point, however, where you do everything you can to make it good for the player, and then there's a handful of players you can't fucking help them. Like, you can't. Um, all right, uh, I think that's it. No, one more? Yeah. Okay. That's an expected question. Uh, when can we expect the Talos Principle 2? The first game was an unreal experience. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think I'm allowed to say yet. Um, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I'm just screwing with you. Trailers being jump. worked on and stuff, so it's not like we're not making it. Uh, and I hope we'll have announcements about that soonish, but I, I'm not allowed to say uh, in case we change our minds because it sucks. <laughs> the next game jump movie. Thank you. Okay, thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. Join us.